Now for a biography of uh, Everett in the 18 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I may leave out a few details. Um, Edward Hamill Everett was an aggressive, wealthy, late 19th century American pre-income tax entrepreneur and capitalist. He was born lucky and luck held with him with rare exception until, until the end of his life. Let me count the ways in which he was lucky. First, he was born 1851 into a wealthy family and grew up in an atmosphere of privilege and ostentation. His father, a Cleveland doctor, died when he was three, but he spent a lot of time in his youth with his uncle Sylvester Everett, who was only 12 years older than he. Sylvester Everett was active in business and politics in Cleveland and later built a magnificent mansion along the legendary Euclid Avenue in Cleveland, a Richardsonian Romanesque uh, mansion that would take a whole series of lectures to really describe. It was located in an upscale neighborhood, just a couple doors away from the mansion of John D. Rockefeller. Sylvester Everett also married well. His wife was a daughter of Jeff the Bay, the founder of Western Union Telegraph Company, and he was a major Cleveland benefactor. Second, Edward Everett's local connections with Bennington were also very fortunate. His widowed mother married Henry W. Putnam, who also had Cleveland origins, but had settled after the Civil War in Bennington. Putnam soon became one of this, lead, one of this town's most aggressive and prosperous municipal and business leaders. Putnam, in 1872, built the Putnam Hotel and the Bennington County Courthouse next to it. He also built an elegant opera house diagonally across from his hotel. Unfortunately, it burned in 1975, 1957, sorry. Mm. And he founded this company's, uh, this community's hospital where old timers here still call it the Putnam Memorial Hospital, now the Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. Putnam manufactured products here and had a national marketing network in uh, New York City. He gave his stepson, Edward Everett, his start in business as a salesman for his products. Third, Everett married very well. As a young salesman, he married the daughter of the owner of one of the glass companies he was selling to in Ohio. Her name was Amy King. In a very few years, he owned a company in Newark, Ohio, and soon changed its name to the E.H. Everett Company. And he was on the road to great riches. During the decade 1887 to 1897, Edward and Amy Everett had three daughters, Amy, Mary, and Anne. Fourth, Everett and his wife settled in uh, Newark, Ohio, a very fortunate location. Um, Newark had the right combination for business success. It had a central uh, Midwest location, had transportation, had water, had silicon sands from which to make the glass, it had coal, and a little later it had natural gas, which led Everett into investing in lucrative uh, gas and oil interest in Texas. And that led to more profitable investments in real estate. Fifth, in commerce, Everett was again lucky in surviving the Panic of 1893 and the Depression of 1896. He survived several strikes and several disastrous fires. But beyond all that, he was lucky in manufacturing a much needed product, glass bottles, for a beverage industry that was marketing itself nationally in a nation whose population literally doubled during his working life. The population of the United States in 1870 was 38 million. And 10 years and 30 years later, by 1900, it was twice that, 76 million. So remember, this was before um, automobiles or trucks added in the picture, and of course before aviation, but there was a mature network of railroads that had been established. By 1898, Everett's company was producing 30 to 40 tons of glass bottles every day. These were for beer, wines, liquors of all kinds, and in a great variety of sizes and designs. Six. Everett was lucky that he was pulling in a huge fortune before there was a significant income tax in the United States, which did not happen until 1916. And he was further lucky to be dependent on the beverage industry before the country passed a constitutional amendment that banned the sale and importation of alcoholic beverages. 
When Prohibition took effect in 1920, Everett by that time was well into retirement. In fact, that was the year he married for the second time. Seven, in 1907, when he was at the relatively mature age of 56, Everett and his wife and three daughters finally decided to use a bit of his fortune for pleasure. They made an extensive tour of Europe and he bought a lovely large vacation chateau, a castle on the shores of Lake Geneva, which you just saw moments ago. Uh, his daughter Amy met an Italian count she would later marry. Um, eight, by 1911 at age 60, Everett decided it was time to retire and he chose to do it in the most extravagant way possible. He hired the socially prominent architect in Washington, D.C., George Oakley Totten, who you just heard about, to build him a city house and a country house, both at the same time. And while these buildings were under construction, he vacationed at his castle on uh, Lake Geneva in Switzerland. Um, you're all well acquainted with this uh, country cottage Everett built here in Bennington. Um, the basic building went up in a remarkably short time of only eight months. And with a crew of uh, 32 expert Italian stonemasons he'd imported. Fortunately for us, Everett engaged a photographer to record the progress of construction. And those century old photographs uh, survive. In fact, you can see them in the, in, in the library where they're on exhibit right now. Then it took another four years to finish the interior and furnish the house in the most elegant and opulent manner possible. Cuban mahogany paneling in the dining room. Italian marble for fireplaces and stairways, English silver for door handles, chandeliers, and wall lamps, paneling of oak on the first floor, maple on the second, and pine on the third. Everett called this whole estate the orchards because of the thousands of acres of apple, pear, quince, plum, and cherry trees he had planted on thousands of acres he acquired just south of here. His flair for horticulture on a massive scale would, could be the subject for uh, a whole series of lectures itself. Uh, for his mansion to, in Washington, to describe it adequately would require another series of lectures. In fact, there's a coffee table sized book being prepared now, by, uh, sponsored by the Turkish uh, embassy. Um, and it's a book that will document and illustrate this grandiose flamboyant mansion which since 1936 has been the uh, uh, Turkish Embassy in Washington. Everett's luck finally ran out shortly after his um, Bennington Mansion was furnished. In 1917, his wife Amy died at the age of 53 while she was in Washington. She became the first person to be entombed in the elaborate mausoleum, a half-sized Greek temple he had thoughtfully built for himself out of granite, not, a, not marble in the Park Lawn Cemetery across the valley here in Bennington. The rest of Everett's uh, story in retirement is pretty well known. Luck held as he was introduced in Washington to a singer named Grace Burnap, who at age 39 was 30 years younger than he. In 1920, they, um, they were married in Chicago. And to the surprise of many, they produced two more daughters. Betty Grace in 1921 and Sarah in 1922. Because of their wealth and ostentation, Edward and uh, Grace were known in Bennington as an imperious couple who comported their self, their, themselves in a Rolls Royce at several social levels um, above ordinary folks here. <laughs> an unusual uh, attribute of Everett's was that despite his great wealth, he was not especially known uh, for his benefactions. With, with one or two exceptions. Um, and um, the, the author of the forthcoming book on the, on the Turkish embassy uh, was here a few weeks ago and, and uh, told me one example of uh, Everett's benefactions that I hadn't known about. And this was in 1919, in between the death of Amy and the marriage to uh, Grace. Um, he allowed his Washington mansion to be used for a charity function. It was called Free Milk for France. It was a national effort by celebrities to buy powdered milk for wounded soldiers and TB patients and babies in France after the, after the World War I. The other exception was his role in 1928 to help establish the Bennington Museum, which involved a renovating an abandoned stone building that had been this region's first Catholic church. 
Um, this was at a time locally when two important institutions could have used some of his fortune. I'm um, thinking that Bennington College was being organized and was very busy raising money to build its own campus. And the Putnam Memorial Hospital's annual deficit was being supported solely by Everett's um, half-brother, Henry W. Putnam, Jr. Um, but, um, in fact, there's evidence that toward the end of his life, Everett's fortune was somewhat diminishing. He spent a good deal of, a good deal of money to make Grace happy, something like $3 million. He had some losses from the sale of properties in Texas, plus losses from his orchards in Vermont and Ohio. And he backed out of a major real estate a deal in, in New York. Everett died in Boston on April 26, 1929, after a series of operations for prostate cancer. One might say that his luck held once again because he died six months before the big Wall Street crash of October, when uh, his uh, fortune would have, would have been somewhat depleted. In 1930, the three older daughters contested their father's will, which they said was overly influenced by the second wife, to favor herself and the two younger daughters. A trial that became known as the longest lasting civil trial in Bennington County history was argued by prominent lawyers. One of them, was Frank Archibald, was the former state attorney general. The other was Warren Austin, who was later elected a U.S. senator and was appointed the first U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. Um, the, um, although the winners were technically the three older daughters, though, actually, in, in fact, a probate judge finally settled the case by dividing it equally among, among all. The estate at the time was estimated at 2.3 million, but another estimate was that if one included shares in the E.H. Everett Company, it could have been worth 20, 20 times that. Grace Everett continued to own uh, this property until 1949, when she first tried to sell it. It didn't sell until 1952, when it was purchased by a religious order and became a monastery. An auction to disperse the furnishings and the contents filled a catalog of 80 pages, and the auction lasted for four days. Now an institution known as Southern Vermont College is the lucky possessor of the retirement mansion built by this most fortunate 19th century American capitalist entrepreneur. Mm -hmm.